All right. If you have your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 2 with me this morning, please. Chapter number 2, verse 1, Philippians. Philippians chapter number 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship in the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. 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 Father, anoint this holy word as it goes forth from the mouth of this messenger. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. To the church at Philippi, the Apostle Paul makes, wants to make something very clear. And that is that when Christ Jesus was in this world 2,000 years ago, the God-man, I'm talking about the God-man, when God was manifest in flesh, that He had a mindset that we all need, and that mindset was humility. He humbled Himself under the mighty hand of God. That's not easy to do, because we are by nature children of wrath. By nature we're pumped up with pride. By nature we have our own way. We go about our own way. And so therefore the Bible teaches that in order to have power in your life and to be exalted by the Lord, you must first abase yourself and humble yourself. The Apostle Paul pleads for unity in the beginning of this chapter, just as he does in the book of 1 Corinthians, when you have sectarianism in the church, when some said, I'm of Paul, some say, I'm of, I'm of Apollos, I'm Cephas, so forth and so on. Then there, are the, there was the sanctimonious crowd who said, I am of Christ. So, you know, we have sectarianism in the church, Not should not be so. For there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. That should pull us together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said in verse number 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that you be like-minded. The only thing the Apostle Paul lived for was his ministry. Paul said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. His life was about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all it was about. And his churches. He said, Let nothing be done through vain glory or strife, but let it each in lowliness of mind esteem other better than themselves. This is not easy to attain. And it comes through a lifetime of yielding yourself into the hand of God. And it comes because you learn something. The Scripture says, Tribulation worketh, worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. When you've lived a while, and you've lost some loved ones, and you've suffered on this world, hopefully that will teach you the lessons that you need to understand how weak and transparent and passing we are. We're here today, and we're gone tomorrow. The Apostle Paul says, Look not the things of your own, but look at on the things of others. Look out for each other. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then he gets into the mind. And this is where we want to stop for a moment this morning. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's telling you how to think. And as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How you think in your heart will determine so much about your character. God does not require you to be perfect. He does not lay perfection before you and say, unless you attain this perfect goal, I'm not going to listen to you or you can't be my disciple. My friend, let me tell you something. There's a lot of well-meaning people out here preaching to people that you can live a sinless, perfect life. They, that's dead wrong. Far, far from the truth. If a man says he has no sin, he says he deceives himself. 1 John chapter number 1. But he said, let this mind be in you, who being in the form of God, this is a strong term. 
It says the Lord Jesus Christ was the very essence of God in visible form. That's what he's saying. All the Old Testament saints, everything they ever saw, they ever touched, ever knew about God, was the Lord Jesus Christ before He was incarnate 2,000 years ago. We call them theophanies, or to be more specific, Christophanies. They're appearances of Christ, which was the appearance of God in the Old Testament. In plainer words, that eternal, absolute spirit being that is invisible, the Bible teaches, no one has ever seen. And I personally believe, you don't have to agree with me, but I believe after studying this Bible for a few years, nothing has ever seen the Almighty. That includes the angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, all of them. Nothing has seen God the Father, but God the Son. He's the only one that can take you to the Father. Therefore, in this world, when you take the Son, believe on the Son, receive the Son, He'll begin to take you to the Father. And thanks be unto God for that. For the Scripture here is teaching then the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God Almighty and nothing short and nothing less of that. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Notice the wording very carefully. The Lord Jesus Christ did not think it was something that He would reach up and take hold of and claim to be His own. That's what that means. Didn't have to do it, because He already was. So in verse number 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made Himself of no reputation. In other words, He didn't come and announce Himself to the world that I'm the second person of the Trinity, fall before me because of who I am. No. His life was lived in absolute obedience to the Father and those that fell before Him were led to Him by the Holy Spirit of God. That's important. He did not demand worship from anybody. Those who by the power of the Holy Ghost had revelation given to them as to who Christ was fell on their face and worshipped Him. So it is today. Same thing. If you love our Lord Jesus Christ, fall on your face and worship Him. Acknowledge Him as your Lord, your Savior, and your God. The Holy Ghost is doing that in you and not yourself. But the Bible said in verse 7, Note carefully, this is important. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Romans used the crucifixion as a means of terror. It was terrorism 2,000 years ago. And when they crucified someone, they crucified them right by the roadside, not in the back but right by the road where people would have to walk by and see that person struggling, suffering, and dying. And then after they died, they left them hanging on that cross so that they could come by and see the mortification as it took place in their mortal body and they could witness the horror and the power of Rome. The Bible said God chose according to Philippians 2, for His Son to die on the cross. He was obedient even to the death of the cross. Now, I don't know how to say to you this morning, the most wonderful thing that you'll ever hear from God is that God could have made you a perfect being in the beginning. He could have made you an automaton. He could have made you a machine. He could have made you to serve Him. And that's what you would have been throughout eternity. And at the least whim of God, you would have answered immediately. But no, God chose to make you a man. And when He made you a man, He gave you a will. And He gave you a will and He exalted you. And lifted you up to a place that no animal has. He made you in His image. He gave you an enormous possibilities. He spread out before you an entire universe and said, this is all yours. Choose you this day who you will serve. You don't realize this morning, some of you really don't because you've been brainwashed by this bunch of leftist dead brain liberals. But friend, 
You are a human being, ages infinitely above the animal creation, and have within you the capacity, a capacity within you that is greater than the angels, greater than the cherubim or the seraphim, and what God has in store for them that love Him, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man, what God will do with you one day. I preached the other night at the funeral of my, of my brother and my sister, province when they passed away. I preached about the heaven, the new Jerusalem, about that city the Lord Jesus said in John chapter number 4. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and pre pre prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. He has been preparing that place for 2,000 years. Your life on this earth will determine what kind of place He has prepared for you in that new Jerusalem. That new Jerusalem is a living thing and He will not be finished with it until the last born again believer accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. We are not all equal when we get to glory. We are not all equal when we get to glory. We're all saved. All have eternal life. But He will reward you according as to what you give to Him in this world. Amen. And to how obedient you are. And at the judgment seat of Christ, we will find out on that day. And I'll tell you something. Somebody said, glory to God. I'm looking forward to all the judgments. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I pray that by the grace of God, he's able, to bend, he's able to take this old rebellious boy. He's able to take him and use him for the glory of God. And for the most part, anything good God's got ever got out of my life, He got it out of me in spite of me. Amen. That's exactly how I feel. And tonight or this morning, once again, I consecrate my life to my Lord Jesus Christ and give it to Him today and say, Lord, I think I know what it means to live a Christian life, but I really don't know what it means to live a Christian life, for a Christian life is a dead, empty life without Christ. Christ must be alive every living moment in this world. Amen. Every moment, every breath, every thought, every place, everything. For to me to live is Christ, the Apostle Paul said, and to die is gain. So the Bible said he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, look at verse number 9. I like this, the way that God does things. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. And given him a name which is above every name. For the humility of Christ, he exalted him. For the faith of Christ, he exalted him. For the sacrifice of Christ, he exalted him. For the love of Christ, he exalted him. For the person of Christ, he exalted him. He watched Adam live his life. He watched Abraham live his life. He watched David live his life. He watched Moses live his life. He watched Noah live his life. He watched all the saints of God live their lives. And every last one of them came short. Every one of them failed in the righteousness of God. But this one came into this world 2,000 years ago. He was born a man just like you are born a man. He was born of a virgin. And for 33 and a half years, he lived a sinless, perfect life. Being tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. When he saw him, he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father was well pleased in His Son. So this is why he says in verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Now let me give you the contrast to that. In the book of 1 Kings chapter number 1 and verse number 5, as David lay a dying as an old man, it was time for him to leave this world. He had children by many different wives. David had a woman problem. It was compounded a hundredfold by his son Solomon, who had a much greater woman problem. 700 wives, 300 concubines. And when it came time for David to come down to the end of the way, there was conflict in his home because of all of his wives and concubines. He had one wife whose name was Haggith. She had a son. His name was Adonijah. Adonijah's father was David. David was the king. 
And Elijah thought, well, since David is the king, I'm the son of the king, I've got a right to the throne. So in 1 Kings chapter number 1 and verse number 5, Then Adonijah the son of Haggith exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And be prepared, and he prepared him chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before them. He made a grand entrance. My right? goodness yeah, gracious. Yeah. Fifty men to run through the town pronouncing, pronouncing Adonijah as the new king of Israel once David has passed on. But there's a problem here. And the problem is that that's not the Davidic line. That's not the line of prophecy. And he's not the son of Bathsheba. And God had already promised that the son of Bathsheba would be the one to be the next king of Israel. And the son of Bathsheba was Solomon. Solomon would be the next king. God had already ordained and established that. Yet Adonijah took it upon himself to exalt himself and go through the streets of Jerusalem and proclaim that he is king. The Bible said, He that exalted himself shall be abased. You cannot exalt yourself. You cannot push yourself into the ministry. You cannot make things happen for yourself. My friend, you cannot do it. You cannot drive sheep. You must lead them. But the problem is that some folks are so stubborn and hard-headed that they think that they can go against what God's Word says and force things to happen and it will not happen. For you can force goats, but you can't force sheep. Sheep will not be driven. Sheep must be led. I remember one time in the Holy Land I heard a bell. We were in Galilee. We were next to the Sea of Galilee. There's a church over there at Capernaum. It's a beautiful place. We were right next to that and I heard a bell. And I looked around and here was a flock of sheep. I mean, as far as the eye could see. And I looked for the shepherd. I shouldn't have had to look for him. He was right in the front. That shepherd was walking in front of those sheep and those sheep were following him right down the line. It didn't matter which direction he went. It didn't matter where he turned, what he did. The sheep followed him exactly the way the Bible said. The Bible said, my sheep know my voice. And a stranger they'll not hear. Amen. That God gave you the Holy Ghost. And if you are a born again believer, you're part of God's flock. And you will find the man of God. And you will follow the Word of God. Amen for that. Hallelujah to God. Our problem is today we got so many charlatans and so many fly-by-nighters. So much confusion. So much garbage. I was telling the Sunday school class this morning, those of you that are in here this morning in Sunday school, you know what I'm talking about. April the 23rd, they've got pick, picked out as another date for the rapture. Yeah. April the 23rd, eight days from now. They'll never stop setting dates. Right. So what do you do the 24th of April, preacher? The 24th of April, he ought to call a news conference, get on his knees and confess his sin where he's in rebellion to God and confess to the whole world, I'm a fool. I made a fool out of myself. I went against what God's Word said. I picked a date. God said, don't do it. And I did it anyway. In other words, repent and get right with God. I've never seen one of them to do that yet. But they sold their books. They sold their tapes. They made their money. How many of you bought their books and their tapes? I went, through my, I went through my books here not too long ago. When I was young, I bought up more garbage than you can imagine. Wimbly, I did. I spent a pile of money. It took me a while to get through this maze, folks. I've learned a lot of things down through the years. I picked up arms full of books about prophecy, arms full of tapes. I carried them to the garbage can, and I threw them away. Just threw them all away. Why? Junk! Had one that said 88 reasons why Christ will come in 88. Well, He didn't come in 88. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I bought it though. Because <laughs> I was young. I was green. I was inexperienced. I was hungry. I was learning. And I thought they knew what they were talking about. They don't. Don't waste your time with somebody picking a date for the second coming of Christ. It's a waste of time. But yes, some folks have to learn the hard way. Amen. Amen. But notice carefully, Adonijah exalted himself. So the Bible says in chapter number 2 of Philippians, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Our Lord Jesus Christ went down into the sorrows of death. He says in the book of Jonah, He went down into the gates of death. He said the seaweed wrapped itself around Him and He was there in the heart of the earth. In the book of Hebrews chapter number 5, in this, this self 
humiliation, this humbling of himself before God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, chapter 5 of Hebrews and verse 7, days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. And though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that believe. I'm so glad that the one that saves my soul knows everything there is to know about a human being. For he lived where I live. Amen. That's what he's talking about in Hebrews 5. And it says this, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. By the things which he suffered. Note carefully what he said in Philippians. Who being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He obeyed God Almighty's will, the will of the Father. Nobody could see him, nobody could hear him, nobody could touch him. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible said angels came and ministered to him. You remember reading that? He went through all of this. He went through every bit of it. And yet nobody could see the one that was strengthening and guiding and leading the Son of God. Did you know there are those out there that are teaching people that the Lord Jesus Christ went into hell? That He went down into the fires of hell? And it was there in the fires of hell that He suffered? And that suffering in the fires of hell was payment for your sins? Listen to me. That suffering in the fires of hell was the payment for your sins. And that while there he cried out to God. And God heard him. And God raised him up from that. And when he raised him up from it, he was reborn. That's when he was born again. When he was raised up from the fires of hell. And then God exalted him to his right hand. So they're teaching people that when he went down into hell. That suffering in hell and burning in the flames was part of your atonement. And let me tell you you something folks and I want to be clear as I know how there is no worse blasphemy on this earth than to teach that the atonement comes from anything but the blood of Christ his blood shed at the cross at Calvary is what washes your sins away not by him, by our by the blood of bulls and goats but by his own blood he entered in one time into the presence of God to obtain eternal redemption it is the blood that was shed at the cross, not suffering in hell, that redeems the sinner. Now it may sound novel, it may sound like this fellow's deep in the Scripture and understands something that we don't understand. I'm sure that after he said that, he's got their attention. But I'm going to tell you something right now, folks, that the cross at Calvary, the blood was shed. And when his soul descended down into paradise, had two sides, he went to Abraham's bosom. There he announced to the saints of God the victory was won. And there he ascended from hell, from, from, from the heart of the earth, and ascended into the presence of God Almighty because he had offered the supreme sacrifice. Let me explain something about hell for you. The Greeks called it Hades. Don't get your theology from Greek. But you can use the Greek text to help explain or understand what the word's being used in the context. They called it Hades. Hades was a place of, 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 of suffering and torment, of stages of suffering and depths of suffering. And according to the Greeks, the lowest hell was Tartarus. Tartarus. The apostle uses that in the New Testament when he said the angels that kept not their first estate are reserved in Tartarus, the lowest hell. The Greeks had a comprehension and an understanding of ancient truth, just like the Romans, like all the rest of them. But they are not the source of absolute authority. If Plato got it right on one point, good for Plato, but Plato is not the source of inspiration and authority. The Lord Jesus made it very clear in Luke chapter number 16 that when the rich man died and lifted up his eyes in hell, there was a great gulf fixed between him and Lazarus. He was in hell and so was Lazarus in the heart of the earth. They were both in Hades in the sense that it had two compartments. They were in paradise that was separated by a gulf between the two of them. In a general sense, folks understood that. That's all they knew. But let me explain something to you. 
The Lord Jesus Christ said to the rich man, He said, we cannot pass from where we are to you. Or Abraham said it to him. We can't pass from where we are to you. The Lord Jesus is doing the talk. He's the narrative. He's the one telling it in Luke 16. He said, Abraham said, He can't pass from here to you. Neither can you pass from there to us. We are separated by a gulf. But we're both in the heart of the earth. And the reason they were both in the heart of the earth is because hell or paradise or Hades, the heart of the earth had not been emptied and carried up into the presence of God. That's why in Ephesians he said he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He emptied that heart and carried them up into the presence of the Lord. Where's the rich man? He's still where he was before because he is in the suffering side of hell. What's going to happen there, preacher, when the book says in Revelation that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, the day will come when the rich man and that side of hell where he's located will be taken out of the heart of the earth for the earth won't exist anymore. It'll be taken and it'll be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. That's where hell will eventually wind up. That's a horrible thing, don't you think? That's a terrible thing. So why would the Lord Jesus Christ, my dear friend, go into the flames of hell with the rich man? What would be the purpose of going in there? Because he certainly was not purging your sins in fire. Your sins were purged by the blood of Christ. Not fire. He went to Abraham's bosom. He went to paradise, to the thief on the cross. He said, today thou shalt be with me in the flames of hell. No. Today thou shalt be with me. Where? In paradise. Exactly. That's where he went. So this garbage of teaching that the atonement, part of the atonement was made in hell is garbage. And folks, I have a problem with somebody believing they're born again that will take the work of Christ at the cross and start teaching and preaching that junk to men and women. No, sir, folks. You were born. You were bought. You were, you were brought into being as a new creature in Christ Jesus by the blood covenant, Hebrews chapter number 9. And that blood covenant was settled, ratified, made law at the cross at Calvary through the blood of Christ. So he was obedient to the Father. But I like this one. Wherefore God has exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Have you confessed Him? I have. And I'll confess Him as long as I can confess. As long as I've got a confessor in here, I'm going to confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Hallelujah. Do you know Him? Do you know the Son of God? Do you know the Lord Jesus? You can know Him, for by the grace of God, He tasted death for every man. Father, in Thy name we pray. I pray You'd use what I've said this morning for the glory of God. I pray for the souls under Your Word that have heard it. Father, I'm a messenger. That's far as I can go. I can't make people do anything. I can't force them. I can't move them. I can't do that. That's not what You want. It'll be by the power of the Holy Spirit of God that they answer to what's moving in their soul and in their spirit. Your word has been preached. And Father, now I pray you bless them in thy holy name. Amen. Let's stand up this morning.